Mo and I were exchanging hair care tips <laughs> backstage. He's doing a little bit better than I am in that department. Um, so Mo and I have known each other since the last bull cycle when we were briefly for a short moment in time at Consensus together. And, um, and Mo is one of the other people that I gravitated towards. I'm choosing my words very carefully. He's one of the other people that I gravitated towards in a very chaotic environment and, uh, and, and has, has always been pretty insightful. So when I knew that he went to Facebook, uh, I called him. I was like, why'd you do that? And, um, and then fast forward a couple years later, and he was insistent, no, this is really killer tech. It's going to be great. And, uh, and then sure enough, some of those relationships and some of that technology has, um, has since spun out. And now we have warring tribes between Aptos and Sui. So we're going to get, in, get into the battle uh, between, uh, between those two L1s and maybe the, the L1 conversation in general. But um, Mo, why don't we just start with like a, a, a level set of how do you view the layer one infrastructure realm, layer zero, layer one, layer two, you know, everybody's kind of arguing about what, what exactly the definitions are. But generally, like the blockchains as settlement platforms, where are we today? What is necessary? And, and maybe why have you spent this time and, and why are you focusing on uh, a new implementation uh, you know, for, for Aptos and, and, and kind of what is going to make it interesting, exciting, and, and then how well, we'll talk about how it's going inter to inter interoperate with the rest of the industry. So level set, how do we get to this point right now? Tell me what you can tell me about the, the journey from doing this in-house at one of the biggest tech companies in the world to now kind of owning uh, a business that's going to be helping build out this community in Aptos. Sure. Uh, first of all, ha great, to, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, geez, it's been a while since our Brooklyn days, um, figuring out what the Ethereum landscape would look like, right? Yep. And where you know, crypto would go. It's the same problems that you and I were looking at you know, in the last bull cycle are still the same problems that persist and uh, are around today. And um, we're excited to be solving that at Aptos, and I'll get into that. But you know, when I joined Facebook, um, I was coming from a pers perspective that Ethereum was having um, an immense amount of success in terms of attracting developers. The counter to that was the network was getting clogged. And you started to see L2s start to form. You, tried to, uh, you, you saw a lot of interest in scaling solutions that you know, were trying to do their best to innovate on top of Ethereum and other infrastructure. N that led to a fragmented developer experience. And that was challenging for me, building Meridio, which was um, you know, a tokenization uh, platform. And I took that pain with me to Facebook. And Facebook was thinking about it from a different lens. They were looking at, well, how do you think about the existing Web3 infrastructure three and a half years ago, well, four years ago, and how do you scale it for billions of people? And if you looked at all the L1s out there, um, whether it was Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the alt L1s that were trying to come to market, they were not solving for scale. They were not able to issue upgrades. They were creating scenarios where security and safety were often compromised for speed. And that's when you know, Libra and DM realized, we need to start something and build something from scratch. Um, and it was amazing to, to have a front row seat and, and drive a lot of that innovation at Facebook. Um, we built two things there, right? It was Libra DM um, as the blockchain, but then also our own smart contract language called Move. And the reason we built Move was you wanted to give assurances to a lot of the smart contract developers that you're giving users a safe asset to play with, one that is composable. Um, and when you look at all the different layers, and I think Vitalik just talked about a layer three and probably a four, five, six solution to solve for scalability, that becomes extremely challenging for developers to build. Imagine you know, Ryan shows up, he wants to deploy an application. You have to now navigate this complex Jenga piece and you know, pray that your application runs. And God forbid someone in that Jenga piece is doing an upgrade and there's some downtime, there's a compromise, that's going to start crumbling. So we really think the, the foundation is starting from scratch. Um, Aptos is building a, a new layer one. Um, it'll be going live later this, this year. But we had, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and, and lie, we had an unfair advantage. You know, we were able to tap into resources that 
you know, not that many people get in, in the Web3 world. We were able to be very principled in our approach, thinking about scale for billions of users across the world, thinking about safety for those billions of users, because if your account gets compromised, you know, what happens? How can you recover assets? And then also thinking about security, not only for users, but also a lot of the developers that are deploying applications and innovating. Um, so, so I think that answers most of your questions. And I'm happy to dig into a couple others. Well, you kind of hinted at it with the unfair advantage. So I will ask, and you can, you can answer you know, to the extent that you can. I know it's obviously a little bit sensitive. But I remember, and full disclosure, I did invest um, in, uh, in Aptos. I've invested in about 70 other companies as an angel so far. So um, uh, obviously, I'm personally excited about it. But I remember when you, you called me, I was like, what's the catch? Like, what, how, how did you pull a rabbit out of the hat? How, how are you getting this, this, uh, this off the ground in this way? What can you kind of share about the evolution and kind of the transition from Facebook in terms of how these different components were jettisoned? Because obviously, I think everybody knows about Facebook's challenge with the regulators and all of the roadblocks that uh, folks in DC put up in particular around Libra, and, and, and it was tough to go from zero to one there, even after a couple of rebrandings and, uh, and some engagement. So um, the core assets, the core IP, a lot of what had been developed did spin out. But just what, what can you share about that story? And I know that there's, you're not going to give all the details, but you know, uh, I think it'd be helpful for people to understand where Facebook ended and where kind of these new yeah. L1s begin. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's a great point. I'll try to be as open and transparent in the spirit of being with a you know, friendly mainnet audience. Um, Facebook was surprisingly um, progressive in their approach when it came to building for Web3. They knew it had to be a permissionless environment. It, they knew it had to be open source and work with the community. The challenges that you alluded to were around who were the constituents and stakeholders for someone like Facebook. And that made it difficult to think about safe asset management. And you know, then you start to go down, you know, where is Facebook live today across the world? And what are the different regulators that a large entity like Facebook might have to deal with? So it's difficult to balance being permissionless, open, Web3 centric, at the same time catering to different regulators all moving at different paces. Um, everything that we built was open source. So you know, if you wanted to take a lot of what we had built and t uh, you know, launch your own L1, you'd be able to. But the analogy is, you know, if I gave you a blueprint for a nuclear power plant, would you be able to build one uh, from scratch? Probably not, right? A lot of resources are required, whether it's capital, whether it's having um, assets that get the nuclear power plant running, or even the team. And that's where we were. Um, I was focused, and Avery, um, my co-founder and, and CTO, he was at Facebook for 10 years. So you can imagine I had to shake him a little bit and uh, get him excited about things. And you know, when you get someone who has a PhD in high-performance computing, who's put half a million servers across the world to work at the same time, so no clock difference, that's a very special opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have 10 PhDs on our team, all from you know, PhDs from cryptography that Vitalik often quotes that are the inventors of Virgil Tree. We have researchers that are uh, the ones that contributed to Block STM. And that gives us that unfair advantage. You know, only Facebook can attract that level of talent. It's you know, the steel sharpening steel or iron sharpening iron analogy. And when you get those group of folks excited about where innovation is headed, um, Web3 open infrastructure and being able to remove you know, bureaucratic processes that come with large organizations, that makes it a, a, an amazing playground for innovation. And you know, I didn't have to do much convincing for our team. Um, you know, we were very fortunate that you know, our, my previous employer understood what this technology can do for billions of people. And we're, we're off to the races. We've launched. Uh, I think we're the only blockchain that's launched four test nets. The first test net had 20,000 nodes show up. We had no incentives. Um, you know, if you look at existing L1s that, that would have tried to incorporate 20,000 nodes in a span of hours, it'd be a lot of you know, challenges potentially. So that level of discipline and infrastructure that we bring, um, it's, been, it's been tested. Um, and we're you know, excited to take it to the next generation. So it's, 
it's a, it's a privilege. It, it really is. For a team that is, I don't want to call it a late mover because we're still kind of relatively early in the uh, evolution of the space, but not one of the OG, you know, kind of uh, all L1 implementations, like you are getting off to a late start. So you have some advantages just from kind of where the project was born and how it was, it was incubated and some of the talent around uh, the hoop. But if anyone knows about network advantages uh, and, and kind of network effect, it's going to be a team that had previously benefited from Facebook's network effects. That is in the rear view mirror now. And Ethereum and some of these other L1s, Solana, we're going to talk to uh, Anatoly in a minute, have, have really been tremendous at building out their ecosystems. And for me, there's been a little bit of an open question as to how many different standards will be feasible, how many different you know, types of uh, secure like L1s will, will ultimately be a thing. Or, you know, or said another way, are we basically going to go back to the browsers, the mobile operating systems? I think the EVM, Ethereum virtual machine, is going to be tough to displace. Is everybody else gunning for second? And then does, do things drop off after that? Or how do you think about the landscape moving forward and how you can develop a wedge? Is it application specific? Is it, you know, some, what's the, what's the uh, beyond the unfair advantage to start? How do you capitalize on that and, and yep. catch up now? Yep. Um, second to Bitcoin or Ethereum, just to clarify? Second to. <laughs> I, I, I think to Ethereum. That's a joke. I'm just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, yeah. we're going to get into it. Bitcoin's an asset. Ethereum's a protocol. And I've, I've been pretty consistent about that, so you're yeah. not going to trip me up. But. Uh, it's, it, it's a great point. I mean, existing L1 ecosystems have done an amazing job of building um, and getting us to where we are today. We're focused on the next billion users, right? And I think that's all, all in all of our best interest. When you look at the... You know, the, the analogy that I think about is the New York City subway system. A lot of people don't know it was three different subway systems that had to be pieced together to support the millions of train uh, passengers today. And when we think about the next billion users, you have to design that infrastructure knowing that those three subway systems have to work together across the world. So we've taken a principled approach on upgradability, and that upgradability solves for scalability. In each one of our test nets, we've upgraded our networks so we can support that level of scale. You know, it's, it's hard to look at, you know, apples to apples comparisons because, again, every infrastructure is making its own trade-offs. But we wanted to test one of our test nets. Um, in June, this is an old number, by the way, we said, let's see how many NFTs we can mint. We were able to mint 2 million NFTs in about an hour. So if you talk about efficiency, that's mass adoption. You know, someone like, you know, Katy Perry can reach out to her fans across different platforms. It doesn't have to be the existing incumbents. And I think that's going to be very powerful Web3, uh, powerful for Web3 and for all the creators that are excited about the potential for Web3, but have hit limitations because of the performance of different networks, the cost structures of different networks, which is incredibly counterintuitive because, you know, why, if all of us are going to Ethereum to use the network, why should costs go up? That's completely and, uh, the opposite of network effects. <laughs> it makes no sense. And then you say, OK, fine. You know what? Ethereum's really clogged. Let's go use an L2 solution. Is that an ideal user experience? You're probably going to get a huge drop off from users. So we're trying to balance for that best user experience and that cost efficient model. And that's what you can do with a new design um, from the ground up. And you know, there's a bunch of things that we think about when it comes to that developer experience. Move, for a developer, is going to be extremely efficient when it comes to the number of hours that you have to spend building something. So you know, imagine you are trying to deploy a smart contract. You don't want to have to go worry about, is my smart contract perfectly structured? We have something called the Move Prover. The Move Prover basically allows a smart contract to be tested in a safe environment before it hits mainnet produc in production. That'll save a lot of time and a lot of resources. We're also going to have uh, something called, um, uh, something that's basically going to allow transactions to be pre-verified and state to be pre-verified in a human-readable way. 
So if you're ever going to send, you know, let's say me some NFT or some asset, you can see the outcome of that transaction before that trans transaction is executed. That's really powerful for Web3. I mean, there's so many times where I'm praying that I signed the transaction properly. Um, and that human readable component uh, really gives confidence to the users. That architecture for Move really sets up developers for success. <laughs> and we think the combination of those two is very powerful and heard of. Um, and if you take those two things together and pair it with performance, high throughput, and low latency, I think you're getting very close to solving um, the trilemma problem. You mentioned NFT mints. Is that the wedge? Like, I, I guess um, volumes are down. Hmm. So you know, we had a period in 2021 where Solana, Avalanche, Polygon, right, a number of other L1s came to prominence, had spectacular years, in large part because of how expensive gas was on Ethereum, right? Gas is, is cheap again, right? Um, and so the, the question is, yeah, there's an enthusiasm gap, and, and yeah, the market is working in terms of supply demand. It's a little bit cheaper to process some of these things on chain. Um, are you trying to nail like a toy implementation first? Is it DeFi? Is it, you know, it is an open environment, but where do you think realistically the wedge is and like the first um, ecosystem will be that is going to leverage what you've built with Move? Um, versus what's already available through some of these other ecosystems. Yep. That's a loaded one. Um, so having had four test nets, we've been able to get You a keep lot saying of, four test nets, right? Yeah. Like, that's a lot of practice. Why don't, you know, is that necessary? I, I think it's necessary. Is that a vanity metric, uh, right? I, I think it's I'm just I'm, I'm lashing onto it because you said it like four times. Like, yeah. well, we'll just get it right the fucking second time. So each, each one of those test nets, we've actually taken feedback from uh, all the developers that are deploying applications on testnet and incorporating that. In, in fact, I, I got pulled to the side by a developer yesterday and um, yelled at because we're moving too fast. He, he, he basically told me we're upgrading our network faster than anyone ever has, and they can't keep up with the implementations. That's unheard of. I mean, just look at how long it took for the merge to take place. And that's not even performance improvement. So you know, it, it is interesting to have these um, test nets uh, leading up to mainnet because it gives um, builders an opportunity to test things out. Mm -hmm. um, there's 200 projects building already, and they're building across some of those use cases that you talked about. Um, there are folks that have built AMMs and DEXs from the ground up. There are folks that are building gaming uh, applications. Uh, we had a hackathon in, uh, in May la uh, this year where eight teams formed. Uh, we had companies, uh, you had developers from Web2, large fangs that snuck out of their offices to come build with us in the Bay. Um, we had engineers from Berkeley and you know, uh, young female coders that were excited about where Web3 can go. Um, we have you know, folks that are veterans that have taught themselves how to code that are building interesting applications um, and oracles along the way. The most interesting thing, though, it, to me is going to be that mass adoption. So collectibles did a good job of popularizing what NFTs mm -hmm. are capable of, but we haven't seen that utility take place. Imagine going from platform A to platform B for gated access uh, and then uh, you know, being able to buy merchandise because you have a really cool NFT. It doesn't mean you have paid hundreds of mm -hmm. dollars or thousands of dollars for an NFT. It just show, shows your fandom and love for the New York Knicks. Yep. You know, maybe. Um, but then you have gated access. That gated access needs to be able to hit millions of users. That's hard to do today with today's infrastructure. You can take that gated access and now turn it into some kind of proof of attendance and use it as a access to an event, potentially. And there are a lot of folks that have been on the sidelines waiting for solid infrastructure to, be, to enable NFTs. Um, so you know, it's hard to pick each one of those use cases. Um, we spent a lot of time with uh, you know, the Web3 folks and the Web2 folks. And you know, I don't know if I should, I, I, I guess I can share it, but our marketing team's going to kick my ass a little bit. But Jump has been spending a lot of time in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And they just announced code completion for Wormhole and Pith. 
and that's been amazing in terms of where you know, existing DeFi applications have been able to go. You have bridges between different L1s, and Wormhole's been an anchor, um, a, a foundational component for that interoperability. Um, and you know, we're very excited to see what, you know, what Wormhole and Pith are going to look like on Aptos. Um, so you know, a little bit of a sneak peek and, and for, for this crowd. Um, but you know, we're super excited where DeFi is going to be supercharged. Right? It's going to show the performance of our network relative to all the other um, L1s out there in the market today. What's the next 30, 90 days, 180? What, what else can you share? So you're giving like little teasers, but <laughs> testnet number five. The, the, uh, the <laughs> testnet, there will not be a testnet number five. <laughs> That's, you know, I guess a, a sneak peek. Um, pay, pay attention. Um, I mean, the name of this conference is, an, is uh, indicative of where we're headed to next. Um, we've been heads down. You know, fall is a very important season for us, is the way I'll, I'll put it. And, you know, when our mainnet goes live, there's going to be some really cool use cases in addition to jump, um, wormhole, pith, and, you know, other uh, interesting DeFi primitives. Gaming is going to be very cool. Um, I can't share names yet, but um, we're going to be enabling one of the largest game, uh, games in the world very soon, and I think that'll be exciting. Um, you know, Im imagine 10 million people being able to earn an NFT in a game, use that NFT to lend it to Ryan uh, if he wants to play something, and maybe if, by lending it, I can earn a little money, right? Um, so instead of all the hundreds of hours I've spent uh, you know, in Fortnite, um, I can actually get some value out of that. So that'll be cool. Um, and I think those economic models are going to be very disruptive, you know, in, in, in ways I don't think people fully appreciate yet. We're just sitting on the cusp of, you know, what does economic value really mean yeah. for these new assets? Uh, that's going to be cool. So we were a few weeks or a couple months away from mainnet at mainnet, I guess, but uh, between, between Your the words. lines. Your words. My words, I know. Um, <laughs> But uh, so it, that's exciting. I, I guess the last question I have um, is, how do you how do you think about the Sui team, right? Do you think about them as a competitor? Do you think about them as, as ultimately advancing a similar like open source library and ecosystem, or taking a slightly different bent as, as you guys? Is it um, like coopetition? Is you know because because you are trying to rally developers around Move, which is the novelty. But um, how, how do you how do you think about the two different chains? Yeah, I mean, um, we're excited about the next generation of blockchains. And you know, the more participants there are that help grow the Move ecosystem, we're going to be rooting uh, for, for Move. Our view is we want Move in the hands of people as soon as possible, which is, again, why we, you know, we didn't write a white paper. We just launched our first testnet. And of course, we just issued our white paper. And I think we're working on some cool stuff with your team that's yeah. going to go live. Um, we want to highlight what Move is really capable of. Um, and get it in the hands of the builders that are out there today and users, ultimately. So our focus at Aptos is to be the best home for Move developers and just developers in general. Um, I'm, I'm curious to see how that adoption will, will um, take place. I'm curious about the reception across different uh, ecosystems. I know Tolly's coming up, and he's been uh, you know, pounding the table about Move, which, which, which we appreciate. Um, but this is going to be a next, um, the next generation for Web3. You know, uh, we, we've seen Ethereum be a catalyst with the merge recently. The narrative is shifting. Everyone is paying attention. Businesses that were anchored towards Web2 and trying to hold on to their platforms are being disrupted. Um, I, there's so many conversations that I have. And you know, whether it's you know, Aptos or Proof of Stake Networks or Move, um, we're excited to be going live within weeks, as you as you stated. So, that's good PR training. See what he did there. He got asked about a competitor. He didn't even, he didn't even say the competitor's name out loud. So that is good PR training. Mo, um, what should people be keeping an eye on other than the event that will not be named in the next you know, few weeks? How can they kind of get involved and stay tuned on the project? I, I think there's kind of three things to pay attention to, especially for this mainnet audience. I had a chance to see some of the folks that are in attendance. Um, one is the theme that you, I think, hit on, right? Like this next generation of blockchains is going to be, um, it's going to be a major catalyst. Uh, I'm uh, people have been excited about Ethereum and the merge. 
I think the bigger theme here is proof of stake networks that are safe, reliable, and secure. And that brings me to my second point. You know, if you're thinking about how to incorporate Web3 at scale, um, whether you're a Web3 company or a Web2 company, pay attention to you know, what infrastructure is upgrading aggressively. What infrastructure is going to guarantee your end users that assurance and that security that they won't have to scrap their entire application and rebuild it somewhere else. And certainly pay attention to, I think, the most undervalued or understated uh, component. I, I think the community in Web3 is extremely collaborative. Um, we take that approach when we think about you know, who our community is. We don't discriminate against Web2 versus Web3. We, we think the world is going to be a convergence between the two. Um, which is obviously an indication of the, this main net crowd. Work together, be kind and be nice to each other, uh, because ultimately that's where we are going to get this vision to come to life. Uh, instead of you know fighting over uh, different different venues, right? And um, and I think that's one message that is going to be very valuable for not only all of us in this room, but a lot of other constituents and stakeholders that are trying to build a safe uh, space for innovation. Well, I appreciate that. I, for one, want to destroy all my competitors, but it's good that there's some good, <laughs> some nice guys in here. So, uh, Mo, always I, a I pleasure. You. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you. And uh, we're going to move right on to next conversation with Anatoly. Cool. Thank you.